Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Legal recreational marijuana blasts off in Illinois. Long lines, product shortages, and more than $3 million in revenue on day one of pot legalization. No one's ever done this here in the city of Chicago. We've obviously had the medical dispensaries operating, but this will be a much larger customer base. Uh, again, we feel as though we're prepared. Meanwhile, a new crop of budding entrepreneurs submits applications to open their own dispensaries. Chicago police say homicides in 2019 fell below 500 for the first time since 2015. Boeing's main competitor, Airbus, overtakes the Chicago-based aircraft manufacturer after a turbulent 2019. And in sports... Trubisky... Depletes the pass! To... The Bears announced they're all in on embattled quarterback Mitch Trubisky in 2020 after a disappointing 2019. Joining us are Craig Delamore of WBBM News Radio, David Shaper of WBEZ and NPR, Ali Marotti of the Chicago Tribune, and Kevin Fishbane of The Athletic. We want to talk about marijuana, but first, Craig, to the international news of the day and the U.S. killing of Iranian military general Soleimani. What has been the reaction from the Illinois delegation? Uh, some of it has been as, predict as, as you might expect, the Democrats expressing concerns. And, and remember, here in uh, the Chicago area, there's only one uh, really a Republican uh, who was in the delegation, and that would be Adam Kinzinger from Peoria. Uh, he was all, f all for it, uh, tweeted out uh, earlier, even before the reports were confirmed, that uh, if you mess with the bull, you get the horns, mm -hmm. and uh, good call. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Dick Durbin uh, basically said, no doubt this was a bad guy, but uh, these dis this decision was made without consulting uh, Congress, and that is a major problem, and there are also going to be repercussions. That was more or less what you were hearing from most of the delegation. A few people were saying, yes, killing him was probably a good thing, but saying he should have gone to Congress first. And most of the members of the delegation are saying any next step should be required. So, so it's kind of falling along national lines where Democrats are, are sounding the alarm, Republicans are supporting the move. David Shaper, um, what, is it, everyone is talking about escalation now into a possible war. Do we know yet, you, you know, what the ramifications of this are going to be? Well, it, it's, it's a very concerning situation. The 82nd Airborne has been called up. There are more troops on their way to uh, the Middle East, uh, U.S. troops. And uh, it, it seems like the world is, is a little bit on edge right now. This turn of events just in the last couple of days has really put a focus on a relationship in, in Iran that has deteriorated over the last couple of years since President Trump came into office. Uh, he has uh, been tr trying to make a point there and, and standing up to the with uh, Iran regime. nuclear deal and 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 dis yeah dismantling the nuclear deal and it's kind of disintegrated uh, out of that and, and and you have to remember how unstable the whole region already is and has been now for a couple of decades uh, since the, the the first Iraq war it might just become more uh, unstable. All right, uh, Ali Marotti, uh, the marijuana industry in Illinois, how stable is that on day three? <laughs> well, I think we'll have to see. There are some shortages, as you noted earlier. Um, but day one came out really strong. We had here in Illinois the highest amount of sales on day one as any other state, and we're the 11th state to legalize recreational marijuana. And is that um, just per capita, or is that just total? They had 3 million in sales? 3.2 million. Only 37 stores. Right, 3.2 million in Oregon matched that. Um, uh -huh. But otherwise, if you're looking at Colorado, it was 5 million in the first week, and that was in 2014. So you're dealing wow. with a little bit of inflation there, but not that much. Um, Michigan, which is the only other state in the Midwest that has recreational marijuana, they did 221,000 sales on their first day, and they only had three dispensaries open mm -hmm. at the get-go. Um, so it's, it seems to be coming on strong here. I mean, part of that is because sales started on New Year's Day. A lot of people had that off work. They had time to wait hours in line. Um, also, we're more populous than a lot of the states out west. And are, are the long lines, uh, do you anticipate they're going to keep up uh, over the weekend? Yeah, I think well through the weekend is what dispensary owners are telling me. Um, maybe 
maybe even higher than they were today and yesterday just because you know people may have gone back to work yesterday and today and they're off again Saturday maybe they're gonna stay home and smoke instead of going out to the bars on Saturday night that sort of thing Kevin Fishbane is this a sign that uh, legalized marijuana should have been the norm here for years that this was a good move yeah I think so I think certainly has been I mean not even I mean there's a lot of other reasons just be just outside of the um, all the money and all the windfall for the state that's going to come and for all these business owners and then you think about all the new business owners that can come into play and have us. And I think, I mean, yeah, if, if your government's around in other states seeing what's happening here and seeing what's happening the first day, you're probably thinking, well, where have we been or where should we be going? Craig Delamore, have there been any hiccups? And we talked about uh, expected shortages, regulatory problems, anything like that? Well, the, certainly the regulatory problems have been more looking ahead. And that is the fact that when this started, the only people who were able to get into it were people who were into the medical marijuana before. So that is, that's a, we're a all fight. White. There who were, are all white. There were no minorities. And now there are no minorities. There are people who are now getting into it and applying uh, who are minorities who could get some of the next licenses. But again, they have to qualify. In some cases, they may need uh, education. And frankly, it's these early sales that are going to pay for any programs that do help people get in. But one other potential hiccup, and this is going to be things that have to be worked out. Uh, there was at least a case of someone from Indiana who came to Illinois, obviously consumed the product before he started driving back to Indiana, was clocked at 103 miles an hour uh, in a 55 mile an hour zone and stopped and uh, again it's you're not supposed to bring the product home if you live in a state that doesn't Although have Although there's illegal. no real breathalyzer for marijuana. Uh, David Shaper, do you believe that these issues with minority owners are going to get ironed out uh, over time? We'll have to see. I mean, there's obviously a great deal of interest. In fact, uh, the <laughs> Chicago City Tr Council tried to put the brakes on on the whole sale of marijuana in the, in the city of Chicago before uh, it, it kicked in. It's uh, it's a touchy issue, and I think I think you know a, a lot of people in the African American community see this as a as an, an issue of of equity because for years and years the, they've been locked up disproportionately for selling drugs for possessing and selling marijuana. Now that it's legal, they feel they're being left out, and and that just really rankles. And, and the bill is supposed to deal with that by offering this fund to assist minority business owners who want to open up new shops. Allie, who uh, are some of these budding entrepreneurs, as we said at the top, um, that are, are vying for new licenses and where might these new shops go? Yeah, so you're seeing all different types of people, all ages applying. I've met some of them. I've interviewed some of them. You know, you have people that want to they're chefs and they want to start infusing marijuana into the food or maybe they run nonprofits in the south or southwest sides and they want to incorporate that there you know there's going to be a lot of different there's only 75 dispensary licenses that are up for grabs right now um, the applications for that closed yesterday so that's where we're seeing a lot of these social equity applicants come in and trying to get a piece of the pie next year we'll see other types of licenses open up there will be what's called a craft grow license so you can open kind of a small facility in the city to grow marijuana there you'll be able to transport it things like that so there'll be a lot of other opportunities for people to kind of get involved and what about bars where you consume there or hookah lounges I mean supposedly uh, the city ordinance was going to deal with allowing it in a hookah lounge or something like that right that's a little bit down the road um, but they're saying at smoke shops possibly and also at dispensaries which is where the weed is sold um, but that would be a different licensing thing you would have to go through there too. and is it pretty uniform in demand downstate Chicago suburbs I mean it's been pretty robust everywhere yeah it has been you know I was talking to um, dispensary owners downstate and it was interesting because the dispensaries are so much fewer and farther between between down there like there's one in Collinsville which is kind of serves the st. Louis area they told me that um, they had people coming from Wisconsin Missouri Iowa all over the place you know and there was another that in, that was telling me it looked like there was a flea market or an auction going on because there were so many people <laughs> parking in fields lining up and they said they had some shortages down there and you know they were telling the people waiting in line hey just so you know we only have chocolate bars right now you might not be able to get what you want and the people were saying hey I just want to see the inside of a dispensary I don't even care if I get to buy it. So anything. there's kind of a novelty thing right now. Kevin Fishbane how does this affect professional sports? I mean will will Cubs players, Bears players, Bulls players be allowed to light up or is that contingent on whatever those leagues policies are? 
are. Yeah, well, Major League Baseball finally took marijuana off their banned substance list. I believe the NHL has as well. NFL always lags behind in these things just because of their the way that they're structured with their ownership. They're always very conservative with that stuff. But I think they've realized that you know they should go in that direction. They should understand that th this is a tough situation. If you are a player in a state where it's legal, why can't you do it? And then, but then you get suspended for four games. Right. So they're, 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 they have to kind of work these things out in some of the sports. And you know, props to those leagues that have already just removed it and just kind of move on. Um, I don't know if we're yet at the point where you start seeing Cubs players, you know, walking in dispensaries outside Wrigley Field yet from a PR standpoint. But you know, maybe we'll get there down the road. Well, and, and if they're if they're taking opioids for pain medication, perhaps they can make the case that this is a safer um, pain mitigation alternative. Craig Delamore, how far have we come as a society when the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois? gets photographed buying marijuana edibles at a pot shop. Uh, I mean, obviously, you have come a long way. Uh, and to, to have a marijuana czar for Illinois. Uh, but I think it's something that has been coming. I don't think we're going to see the social impact of it for a long time. Uh, and But eventually, there will be. But I think the other thing that we talked about, the expungement, the mm -hmm. the um, removing the penalties for people who and, and, and turning things back for people who have been convicted before that may be and that was meant to be one of the biggest parts of this that effect also is going to be coming along and rolling as more and more people uh, have their records either expunged or are have them forgiven no doubt this will be an ongoing story uh, throughout the year Ali Marathi what are dispensaries telling you about their supply and do they feel they can keep up with demand yeah so they're running low you know um, the biggest thing is the flower which are the dried buds that you can smoke um, they're they were telling me that they're getting new shipments in every day and they're trying to stretch it as far as they can a lot of them have buying limits in place for people spending limits that sort of thing and the idea there is just kind of to make sure as many people as they can can buy weed. Right. Um, but for the medical patients, that shouldn't be an issue. You know, there's a it's built into the law that dispensaries have to provide product for medical patients. So the shortages, um, though some dispensaries were experiencing them before recreational sales started, um, the buying limits are mostly for recreational customers. All right, well, we're going to follow this uh, as this unfolds, but let's move to some more Chicago headlines. Chicago Police Department says homicides in 2019 decreased for the third year in a row with less than 500 recorded last year. Depending on your lifestyle, living here might cost a little more in 2020 due to new laws and taxes, and some Chicago-based developers are focusing on other U.S. cities. Is that a troubling sign for Chicago's economy. Craig Delamore, this 500 homicide benchmark, is it an important benchmark to meet uh, now that the city says it will finish 2019 under that? Well, it's certainly the kind of goal that the mayor wants to set uh, because the city has been way over it. There has been progress, and the city, is because of some of the way it's enforcing the law, and maybe it's some of it because population is dropping, but we are seeing fewer uh, murders and fewer shootings. But remember, uh, to uh, mix the metaphor here, the bar is actually still pretty high. Even though the numbers are lower, we are still higher than Los Angeles and New York. In fact, I think they Although put not the combined anymore. I think yeah. in 2019, um, New York and L.A. combined were higher than Chicago. Years past, that wasn't the case. Uh, David Shaper, the police department's also reporting a higher rate of solving murders in 2019. Uh, what are we to make of those numbers? Well, they're crediting uh, a greater use of technology. Uh, uh, cameras are, are prevalent everywhere, so they're catching shooters that way uh, in, in some cases. But they, there's also a little bit of funny business, I think, that the city plays with the, uh, the numbers and what they consider a cleared case. They can identify a suspect, the police can, but if prosecutors don't have enough evidence to prosecute the case and bring it to court and don't file charges, that's still considered it's an cleared. Case. It's unsolved, but it's considered cleared by the police department because they've identified a suspect. That suspect could 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 pass away. That the suspect could be uh, could die, could move away. If for whatever reason they can't track that person down or file charges, the police will still consider it cleared, even though uh, th there's no justice in the end for the, for the victims. And so uh, th there's there's other things that are happening. I mean, you're talking about some of these numbers are actually from years prior they're not this year's murders that murders they're solving. that happened in years some of these investigations do year. take a long time and so uh when the, when they finally piece the the, the puzzle together and, and make an arrest 
uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, that's this one of this year's homicides that's solved. So, so it's, it's it's a lot of sort of uh, moving pieces in those numbers. Ellie Marotti still not great. You got to remember. I mean, they were it still was not around. They were saying 50 percent this year, which is much higher than typical. Usually they're running in the in the 20 percent. <clears throat> in the 20 percent, and which means if you if you kill someone in Chicago, you still have a better than 50 50 chance of getting away with it. All right, Ali Marotti, remind us, uh, we talked so much about the new pot laws, uh, uh, Uber laws, rideshare taxes. Uh, w what else sort of went into place in the new year? Yeah, so in Chicago, the taxes on rideshare is going to go up if you get um, an Uber or a Lyft downtown, central business district. You're going to see it go up, I think, about three times. It's going to be noticeable um, on your paycheck. There's a lot of other things going into effect. Um, in Illinois, you won't be able to watch YouTube while you're driving or stream other services like that. It's already illegal to drive with a device in your hand. And so mm. I guess they thought it was necessary to tack that on as well. Um, other things we're seeing, fees for dining out are going to go up. There's taxes there. Minimum wages are going up. There's, I think, over 250 new laws that are going into effect. So there's a lot. All right. Well, we can't get into each uh, 250 new law, but we do have to move on to some business stories. For the six years in a row, Illinois' population decreases this year by more than 50,000 people. Boeing had a rough 2019 and was overtaken by European competitor Airbus for the first time since 2011. And Chicago Trolley and Double Decker Company calls it quits after 25 years of service. David Shaper, you've been following this Boeing story since um, before the crash of the 737 MAX, or two crashes. Right. Uh, the CEO steps down. There's been major upheaval. Uh, is this company in trouble in 2020? I think it still is in deep trouble. I, they have supposedly had a fix ready to go for the 737 MAX that would uh, repair the, the flight control system uh, and make it work better so it doesn't force the plane into a nosedive uh, anymore. And uh, they haven't been able to implement that. They haven't been able to get regulatory approval on that. Uh, just before the end of the year, the Federal Aviation Administration stepped in and said, uh, you're, you're pushing us too fast. Hit the brakes on this. Uh, we're not going to prove it quickly, uh, so it'll be February or March at the earliest, from what I'm he hearing before and this fix. Is that be guarantee approval, or, that's or not, they it's not approved? still not a guarantee that it'll ever be approved. And so this plane, uh, which Boeing has so much riding on this plane for its future, there are 5,000 almost of these planes ordered. They that are just sitting there. They delivered uh, about... 400, a little fewer than 400 to airlines. They've already made another 400, almost 500 that are just sitting parked. They can't deliver them to their customers. Uh, airlines are going to be strapped because they don't have these planes to put into their fleets and fly passengers around the country and around the world. It's it's a real dire situation. When I mean, you see the news that their competitor Airbus has overtaken them, is, is that an important benchmark? Well, it is kind of. I mean, uh, there are two major airplane manufacturers in the world, Airbus and Boeing, and being number one is kind of a big deal. But when you have your plane, what your 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 primary uh, passenger jet grounded and you're unable to deliver, to deliver it to customers, obviously you're going to get beat and beat pretty badly by a, a manufacturer that doesn't have that problem. What about their stock price? I mean, apparently it hasn't been hit so bad. It really hasn't, which is which is one of the most surprising things to me. I mean, even today, the stock surged because Boeing is a big defense contractor. Right. Uh, it, it, it tailed off before the end of the day, and it still was down for the day. But uh, you know, because of the, the unrest in the Middle East, uh, the possibility of of war suddenly raises this uh, the stock price, and I think it's it's down. I think for the year was about twenty percent or a little more than that. Uh, so shareholders still haven't really paid a significant price, it seems. I right, we have to watch that in 2020. Yeah. Significant uh, developing business story. Kevin Fishbane, um, people continue to leave Illinois. Uh, can, can we boil it down to one simple formula as to why we're net losing more residents than nearly any other state? Well, it's an interesting uh, correlation versus causation, right? I saw one of the Tribune stories interviewed a couple who said, well, it's too cold and the taxes are high. Well, okay, you know, taxes are probably always going to be high and taxes are going to be high in a lot of places. And there's a lot of places that are cold. Um, so it's an interesting thing. You know, I wonder, well, especially when we talk about all the new laws in 2020 and how that's affecting people's pockets, knowing, having a better understanding about where that money is going. Because you could argue, well, if that money goes to the right place and we use it well, it's better schools, it's um, better infrastructure. So maybe Maybe that should make Chicago specifically a better place to live. Um, so that's kind of part of the messaging plan you would imagine for the mayor and, and for the city and the state. Is it, is it time to raise the alarm if you're Governor Pritzker about a dwindling tax base, especially when you've got huge debt to pay off? I, 
Yes, but I don't think that's why, I mean, don't forget, we're not talking about attracting more people here and attracting companies here. We've had a boom in construction that may be- In Chicago. In Chicago. But <laughs> no, people are leaving the Chicago area in some cases because of crime. Uh, that's where you're getting some of the, you know, the challenge neighborhoods where people are leaving. And you're also uh, because of getting, trying to get jobs. So there are so many factors that move into this that I think there is not one formula that can help this. There, there is a whole panoply of things that has to happen before you're going to see that trend slow. One of those things is uh, warmer weather, but no <laughs> one can, can really can control that. that. Ellie Marotti, <laughs> why did the Chicago trolley and double-decker bus company just all of a sudden decide to halt services? Well, all the owners would say that it was a business decision. We don't know much beyond that. Um, it sounded like the employees were taken a little bit by surprise, too. There are about 150 employees that are going to be affected by that shutting down. Um, it's owned by a private equity firm that bought them about a year ago. And if you think about these double-decker buses, they're kind of iconic here, right? I mean, they were the ones that the Cubs rode in in their victory parade when they won the World Series. And um, the Blackhawks have done several Stanley Cup parades. I think Oprah did a couple things in them, too. So um, tourists will miss them for sure. It'll be interesting. All right, let's move on to sports. Despite a disappointing season, the Bears are sticking with starting QB Mitch Trubisky. Outfielder Luis Robert locks into the White Sox for six years and $50 million. And the Bulls and Blackhawks are both ranking low into their 2020 seasons. Does either team have a shot at the playoffs? Kevin Fishbane, you were there uh, covering general manager Ryan Pace and head coach Matt Nagy in their postmortem on the 8-8 eight eight season. And Ryan Pace says right away, yes, Mitch Trubisky is our starter in 2020. What do you make of that? You well, know, I think the first thought is it's good that the marijuana laws went into effect <laughs> a couple of days later for a lot of Bears fans who heard that. But I, I think Ryan Pace is in a situation where this is the quarterback he is tethered to. He needs Mitch Trubisky to succeed. He also doesn't have anybody else right now. He can't go out and say, you know, I'm not sure if he's going to be our starter because he has no idea who he's going to sign or who he's going to draft. So, you know, remember, he signed Mike Glennon a couple years ago and it did not stop him from drafting Mitch Trubisky. I don't know if his words on Tuesday are going to stop him from signing another quarterback. I think we all know there's going to be a different number two quarterback who might eventually be the number one here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's just he's sticking by his guy for now. What about rumors of Alex Smith, the former Kansas City quarterback that Matt Nagy coached to success? Um, he's had a brutal knee injury. Is, is he on the radar for the Bears? I think he is. I think he's somebody that it makes sense as a one- or two-year guy. You know, he's older. Um, there's a lot of money involved with this contract that Washington's going to have to figure out. Um, but the, the idea is that Mitch Trubisky can't run Matt Nagy's offense the way Matt Nagy wants it. So who wins in that power struggle? Is it the is, Should the head coach design his playbook better for his quarterback? It certainly doesn't seem like he wants to do that. Which he does not want to do. Or should the quarterback just be better at this playbook? So th th I think we're going to learn a lot about who has a stronger voice between the GM, the quarterback, the head coach, based on who they that other quarterback is they bring it in. It could be a power struggle here. Uh, how are the Bears doing in, in their salary cap position? There's a lot of help they need on offense, but they have a lot of money tied up into some big-name defensive players. Yeah, they're okay. You know, they just signed Eddie Jackson to a contract extension today, so they have enough money to do something like that. And then they also um, they have a bunch of guys they can cut. You know, Kyle Long is one of those guys who's been revered in this town, um, but you look at his contract, you look at some of these other players, they might be able to move on from them, create more cap space for a quarterback down the line, for a tight end, another big position of need for them. The White Sox uh, uh, signed someone that they're going to need in 2020, Luis Robert, the uh, star outfielder who hasn't played a game in the majors yet. Why did they sign him to such a long-term contract you know, without any sort of sample size of his major league play? Well, you just watch the YouTube clips of him and you're, you're mesmerized. I mean, he is an incredible, gifted, physical specimen, um, and he can play. He can be your leadoff hitter. He can hit for power. He can play the field. And I think they are also showing to their other young players uh, a commitment to someone who they found in their system to bring him in, not to screw around with making him wait like the Cubs did with Chris Bryant a few years ago. So mm -hmm. I, I think it makes a lot of sense with that. And then, I mean, there are people that said he's going to be better. He could be better than Aloy Jimenez, who was supposed to be kind of the guy. So, I mean, the White Sox are in 
pretty good shape right now to kind of be maybe the team in this town in 2020. At the very least, it's going to be interesting to watch them. Are they done making uh, moves in free agency? I don't think so. You know, th their bullpen needs some work, uh, and they could also certainly get get another power hitter at some point um, uh, for that offense. But I, I think if they can if they can really work on that bullpen, because their starting rotation looks pretty good right now. You mentioned all those young players in the field. They get that bullpen good. They're in good shape in the division. Are the Cubs just going to sit on the sidelines for the rest of uh, the offseason? Well, Paris, the Ricketts family needs more money, right? <laughs> they, they can't afford some of these guys that every every Cubs fan wants. Well, I wants. thought they started a new TV network that's supposed to <laughs> right? give them all kinds it's of money. To. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big name is Chris Bryant. I mean, are they actually going to trade Chris Bryant? That's going to be kind of the number one topic for the next few weeks as we continue to watch that. I think until they decide what they're going to do with him, it's going to limit other things. Wilson Contreras to see another guy that they might decide to move at some point. But they're in this weird spot where they have a few needs. But also, if you look at the roster, you think, well, if all those guys play as well, we know they can, they should be back in the World Series again. But it's obviously not that simple as we saw the last two years. All right, well, we're out of time. Happy New Year to you all. Happy New Year to you all. Uh, and we will see you all on the next edition of the Week in Review. Craig Delamore, David Shaper, Ali Marotti, and Kevin Fishbane. That's all the time we have. I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to do a quick prediction. Uh, Craig Delamore, what story are you watching for next week? For next week, I think we want to watch the f uh, whatever happens to uh, the efforts to stop gentrification around the 606 that raised uh, way of uh, jogging and bicycling on the north side. Some aldermen think that uh, something needs to be done there about moving some, people out. Some hearings on this. David Shaper. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, Boeing is supposed to stop production uh, at, at its plant, 737 plant in, uh, in, in Renton outside of Seattle. If that trickles down and all the other manufacturers who feed that plant, the airplane parts, if they slow down, there could be a really big manufacturing slowdown across the country. Their supply chain is huge, and, wow. and it could have so a this, real this big ripple rever effect, rever effect through the industry. entire economy. Sure. Ali Marotti, I'm guessing, has something to do with marijuana. It's going to be more weed for me, for sure. <laughs> um, I'm going to be watching those lines at dispensaries, see if they die down. I'm going to keep an eye on the shortages, um, and then just seeing what's to come. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.